We learned last week Jesus did not come to save the righteous, but those who are in need of a doctor, right? So how do we approach God just as you are, just as it's stated? We we come broken, we come empty, and then allow God to be God through us and for us. Wonderful message for us to go into the message. So let me ask you, if you would, to turn to Mark chapter 3. That will be how we'll continue the message. Verses 31 through 35. Mark 3, 31 through 35. Give you a moment to turn there. And once you have that, if you're able, join me in standing. Let's stand together in honor of reading God's Word. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And we pray that as part of God's family, we listen to his word this morning. You may be seated. It's just really neat how the Holy Spirit works in in, uh, investigating Scripture and what God's going to bring to our attention, how we're going to listen and learn what God's doing, and and how He has uh, been been providing a common thread of understanding His community of believers, right? God's community of believers, how God defines community, how Jesus defines community, how we're invited to be a part of God's family. Remember last week we talked about how in 830 service, you heard me reference, this party's for everybody. When he called Levi, he threw a party, he was excited. And I, lo- I love how God has orchestrated this, but he gave me a word here as we were singing. Uh, it's an illustration I'm most excited about that it's going to come up, but I think it makes sense. So we'll, we'll see how the Lord uses that. And I love how the Spirit's in real time. And so that's certainly happening this morning. And as we open up Mark chapter 3, uh, we see what Mark often does in stories. And he breaks a story apart into two sections and places a separate focus in between and sandwiches it together. And so that's what's happened with this interaction here with Jesus' mother and brothers. So I want you to look back at verse 20 in the same chapter, and we'll see the beginning of that, the uh, top of the sandwich, if you will. And we just read the bottom part of it. In verse 20, it says, Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. It's kind of interesting. So Jesus is in this house. A bunch of people are gathering around, and and his family hears about this, and they believe they need to go help him because, well, they're not sure if he's going crazy. And then we hear of an interaction that follows there where some scribes uh, start to accuse Jesus of working with Satan. Obviously, that's not true. So they were uh, ignorant of what was really taking place and how Jesus was, is, the Son of Man, Son of God here. And and we see him describe this and show this and how a house cannot be divided against itself. His power comes from God alone, not the devil. And so that interaction happens in the middle of this larger context of what we're looking at here, of Jesus teaching some folks. A crowd has gathered His family is not sure. Maybe some opposition is starting to arise. Maybe they really do think he's kind of going crazy and they want to go help save him. Maybe get him out of a tough situation or maybe just save the family reputation a little bit and and get him out of there. They need to get him to come out of that situation altogether. And so they arrive. It's full inside the house. So they send someone in to bring Jesus out. Their concern, their concern for Jesus and and the scribes' concern for what Jesus was doing disallowed them to understand Jesus' intent. How many times do we misunderstand Jesus' intent in the same way? Meaning, How many times have we thought a scenario should be a certain way 
and it's not. And so we're so focused on how it's not what we imagine that we miss out on what Jesus is doing. His family wasn't really sure why Jesus was doing this. This is not how I pictured what you'd be doing, Jesus. The scribes are saying, I don't really understand the way that you're doing this stuff. I thought it would be different. So neither group fully understands what's taking place in their midst. And so Jesus' family sends someone in, and, and marvelously, Jesus addresses it and addresses us at the same time. He asks the question, who are my mother and my brothers? Surely that got their attention. Hey, your, your mom and your brothers are outside. And he asked, who, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? What are you talking about, Jesus? It's Mary. You know Mary, right? You know your brothers, right? So what is he getting at here? And then he looks at the crowd and he gazes at them. He's gazing at us and he says, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Family is now defined as those who hear and obey God's word. This isn't just a prescription of how family will be defined. God's family of believers is this. So let me, let me reiterate that. This is a description just as much as it is a prescription, right? This is not saying, Jesus, uh, this is going to happen. This will be the reality. Jesus is saying this is the reality. Whoever does my will, after hearing my will, that's my family. And he can say that. He can do that. He's defining reality here. And Jesus' definition of God's family is important because really this is the basis of the Gentiles being able to receive, being a part of God's family, being a part and grafted into the covenant, right? Because Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And so anyone who hears God's word and puts it into practice is considered to be a part of God's family. Let me remind us this is important for us because we're Gentiles, we're not Jews, right? So this is an important message for us. This is the basis of how we are engrafted into God's family, God's chosen ones. We hear Jesus' words and we do it, right? Lamar Williamson Jr. says it this way, this is what Jesus is saying here. This is a marching order, an invitation, a promise. Whoever will hear and do this word may become the true relative of Jesus. And if you look in Mark 6, verse 4, Jesus says, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. Oftentimes, those closest to Jesus misunderstand what he's doing. Let's sink in. That's us. That's me. Oftentimes, those closest to Jesus miss out on what he's doing. Because we come, I come to him with a posture of, I already know what you're doing. And when I approach Jesus with the inclination that I already have figured out what Jesus is doing, I'm disallowing myself from hearing how he is defining reality around me. Maybe the people here, the family in particular, thought Jesus was off or out of his mind, as scripture puts it, because they had an inclination of the, the way they thought Jesus should be acting. And it disallowed them to hear how he was truly defining reality. I thought about this. I, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, scripture tells us that Jesus' family thought he was crazy at this point. This is kind of wild what Jesus is doing here. I, this is not right. This is weird. What are you doing, Jesus? And it makes sense, Really? Because everybody else, including us, right, we're coming from a sin-filled perspective. We have sinful minds. We have our own agenda. We have our own perception of ways we want things to be. We are sinful, right? Jesus, not so. Perfect. No distortion of reality. Pure connection to God to hear God's word and obey it and enact upon it, right? So to everybody else who's not perfect, that's everybody else but Jesus, there's times it can seem kind of funny. It can seem kind of off. It's just it's making sense. Our perception of reality, our sinfulness gets in the way. So Jesus says, listen to me and obey. 
That's how you're part of God's family. You ever had a, a situation where you, you thought you understood a scenario, but everybody else is interpreting it different than you are? Everybody else sees it different, and then they're all in agreement on how they're seeing a situation, and you're not seeing it that way. I'm primarily speaking about other believers, and they just see a scenario different, and you're like, I don't, it seems off. How are y'all getting that out of this? I don't see it that way. It's a time for us to listen to the collective voice of God through those who are hearing his word and doing it and be redirected there. Our sinfulness can easily creep in and get in the way of our perception and understanding of what Jesus is actually doing. Jesus, in other words, alone holds reality. There's only one reality. Jesus alone holds it and defines it. Right? So anything averse to that is not reality. It's from our own sinful perception. And so things of Jesus, true reality, can seem off, funny, different. Right? So here's the illustration, and spare me, yes, it's sports related, I know, but I enjoy hockey, you've heard me say that, right? Years ago, we had a team in North Carolina come to Raleigh, professional team, right? And so we were, we were going, and, and I, I understood the rules pretty well, my dad did, so he taught me all the rules, things that were going on, and we went with some friends to a game, and we were enjoying the game, and, and just the basics, let me give you a, the bare basics here. Each team has six players on the ice at one time. Now, most teams, most everybody, they're going to have five skaters and a goalie, right? But if you're down, if you're losing toward the end of a game, it's very common for a team to take their goalie, put them on the bench, so another guy can come on and try and tie it up, right? Because if they score another goal, who cares? You're already losing, right? When time's going down. And so everybody who knows hockey realizes this reality. They understand it's very common. Oh, there's a minute left, there goes the goalie. They're anticipating it. It's not a surprise to see the goalie get out of the net and go to the bench so someone else can come on. Well, a buddy of mine, his parents came and his mom was sitting close to us and my dad and we were there and she sees the goalie go to the bench and she starts freaking out. She stands up and yelling, there he goes, what's he doing, what's he doing, what's he doing? There he goes, there he goes. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? She didn't realize in a common place to watch the goalie go to the bench so someone else can come on and they try and score and tie it up. Everybody else who was aware of reality in the sport of hockey anticipated it, accepted it, it was no big deal. Someone who was not aware of that reality, not aware of the rules at play, they were freaking out because they didn't understand. And she was the only one who didn't understand and the only one that was acting out. See the connection? Has there ever been a moment, not the only one, I'm sure, right, where you were freaking out and everybody else was like, what are you doing? It's pretty clear what Jesus is doing here. Not really sure why you're panicked. You ever had that? And you're, you're kind of worked up about it, and I'm all worked up, and I'm, I've got questions, Jesus. I'm not sure about the scenario, and, and everybody else is like, it makes total sense. I get it. Don't you see this, this, and this? Well, no, I don't. I don't understand. What about this, this, and this? And we're like, what are you talking about? And so there's a moment to listen to Jesus defining reality. When you're caught up in your own will instead of God's will, you're estranged from the family of God, and the only way to be reconciled back unto God's family in unity is to hear God's word and obey it. That's the only way. And so the inverse has to be true as well. This is not a hard move. This is not a tough theological twist. But if to be a part of God's family is to hear God's word and obey it, if you don't obey God's word, are you even hearing it? And are you a part of God's family? It's not a hard move. Theologically, that is 101. Theology 101 right there. Jesus is stating the reality at hand. This is how you're part of God's family. You hear my word and you obey me. So if you don't hear God's word and you don't obey him, are you a part of God's family? The answer is no. And let's make sure we realize the connection. Those two 
things within Jesus' definition of reality are inseparable. You hear God's word and you obey it. The obedience is the aftermath of the hearing. And so if there's not obedience, have you even heard God? No. If there's no obedience, you haven't heard. You know, I can, I can hear things, right? I can listen to things, but I, I don't comprehend it unless I enact upon it. I could sit in a class, I could hear someone teach me about something I, I have no experience with, but unless I act upon it, it's going in one ear right out the other. It's useless, right? And so unless I obey what God's Word says, I'm not hearing it. There's evidence of that. And the evidence of obe obedience, obeying, is discipleship, growing as a disciple and making disciples. The outward expression of obedience are others being discipled under your discipleship. This is Jesus' command. I mean, people at times, they say, well, I, I just don't know what God's will is. I'm not really sure what God wants me to do. I, I don't know what to do as a Christian. It's very clear, right? It's very clear. Scripture teaches us very clear, and Jesus is very clear that as we accept him as Lord and Savior and are being discipled, we go out and make other disciples. So if that's not happening, What's the conclusion? Are you hearing God's word? Something was off for me spring 2003. I was estranged from God's family and my own earthly family as well. Moved away. Spent several years away on my own, doing my own thing, my own apartment several buddies and had created kind of this family system, if you will, of similar-minded folks. I wasn't hearing God. I wasn't obeying God. I had created my own atmosphere of what I wanted family to be, so quite frankly, I could do what I wanted to do. And so when I was surrounded by other people who were doing what I wanted to do, it was quite easy to do it. There was no opposition to it. We weren't being a part of God's family. We weren't obeying. But through a series of events, the Lord brought to my attention very clearly in an apartment in Raleigh. My roommate at the time had gone to work, sitting in the living room by myself. I, I shared this in one way or another, I know. God very distinctly spoke to me that right here and now you have a decision to obey me or not, and this set of consequences will be extremely different versus this set of consequences. Choose. Plain and simple. It was, it was done. Playtime was over. It's time to be serious. Answer God's call or not. I answered God's call, and I'd love to say it was smooth sailing after that. Absolutely not. Very difficult. A lot of trial, a lot of error, a lot of transformation taking place to hear God's word and obey it. In other words, it's a lifelong process, right? It doesn't just happen. It's a lifelong journey. When we profess that Jesus is Lord and Savior and we've asked him to forgive our sins and we say we're going to follow you, Jesus, the rest of our life, you are our Savior, you are Lord, then we embrace the journey that is continually hearing God's word and obeying it. It's not a static decision. I heard you, Jesus, now I obey you. It's dynamically moving within that reality day in and day out. I'm hearing God's word in the moment. I mean, we just sang beautiful hymns that illustrate this. Hearing God in the moment and making decisions based on what God is saying so we are proving we're hearing God in the moment. And so you may ask, okay, it's, it's clear. I love Jesus' clarity in this. He, he gives us a very clear sequence of how we allow him to define reality, hear his word, and obey it. There's really nothing abstract about that. So what is God's word and how do you hear it? That'd be a good question, right? We hear God's word by and large through prayer. Jesus teaches us a model prayer. We revere God's holiness. That means as we pray every day, we acknowledge God's presence. That's the basis of prayer. And as we dialogue with God, we pray for our daily needs to be met. We pray for our sins to be forgiven and for us to forgive others who have sinned against us. And we pray that we're not led into temptation. Right? And we also study 
Scripture. We study it. We don't just read it. We study it. Y'all like me in school? Remember school days? There's a difference between reading and studying. I could read a paragraph three times and not remember a word of it. But when I was in the mood to study, then retention set in, right? We have to study God's Word. We have to study what He says as we prayerfully consider it. And we learn when we do study it that Jesus hears our thoughts. He disciplines what we should be thinking about. We learn what it means to love our enemies and not judge others. When we study Scripture, we learn that Jesus provides for our physical, spiritual, and emotional needs. We learn that the power of the Gospel is mysterious and the Holy Spirit lives through us as believers and transforms us and gives us the perception that is God's. And we learn through Scripture that we have an eternal destination waiting for us in heaven. Jesus says, I'm going to make a place for you. And in the meantime, obey what I bring to your attention as you await that glorious reality so that you can experience it here on earth. Remember, heaven on earth, God's will is supposed to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that also others will be discipled in the process. In other words, so more people get to come to the party. And we learn this in Scripture. We pray, we study, and we do life together, and we encourage one another, and we mature in the process, and we see others come into the fold. And we embrace the journey that is hearing God's Word and obeying it on a continual basis. Remember the illustration I used a long time back about the mother eagle? Y'all remember that? Or about the mother eagle? You may already know where it's going. You know what a mother eagle does to get the eaglet out of the nest to accept its next stage in life? It takes that once comfy nest and starts removing parts out of the nest so it's uncomfortable. That eaglet that once sat in a very comfortable nest, being fed, not really having to do anything for it except open its mouth, starts to find that same nest uncomfortable. That stick, I don't remember that stick being there. It's kind of sticking in my behind. A rock? Where'd that rock come from? I remember that. Wait a minute, I can't, I can't find my spot anymore in here. It's not comfortable. So what does the eaglet have to do? It has to jump. It has to do what it was intended to do all along and fly. How weird would it be for an eaglet to choose discomfort in the nest over embracing its God-given purpose, flight. It'd be kind of odd, right? And so there's a situation at hand that what was once comfortable, what was once necessary in that moment is no longer necessary and is no longer going to be available. So that you see the avenue for you to embrace the next moment in life that God brings to your attention, the reason you were created in the first place. Just as it would be pretty weird for an eaglet to remain in an uncomfortable nest instead of flying, it's pretty weird for Christians to hold on to what God used to be doing instead of embracing what God is currently doing. If you find yourself saying, well, I, I was faithful to God in this manner, and I just don't experience the same comfort and peace and fruitfulness as I once did, it's quite possible that God has moved on and you haven't. And he's waiting for you to follow. T.D. Jakes puts it this way, there is nothing more frustrating than trying to remain where God once was instead of going to where he has already gone. Let me ask, are, are any of you in the nest? Is it uncomfortable? Wouldn't you rather fly? Embrace your God-given purpose? In other words, what's God bringing to your attention for you to obey? And you've said no to it far too long and wondered why it's so frustrating. It's time to obey what God brings to your attention because Jesus defines that's the only way we're a part of his family. That gets my attention. For me to participate in God's family, I hear his word and obey it. 
That means I don't get to orchestrate how I wished things were. I am continuously journeying with other believers to embrace what God is currently doing. And in doing so, others are invited into that because when you live with such recognition and obedience to God's activity, others absolutely engage that. It's off, in other words. It's foreign. It can even seem crazy at times, and people want to know why. And there's an opportunity to expose why you're obeying God, you love God, and you're, you're listening to his word on a continual basis. We're charged to go out and to invite others to join in this process. Others need to be exposed to God's will by you continually listening to him and obeying what he brings to your attention. Listen to God's word this week and obey it, and you will be amazed at the results. So here's a challenge. Here's a challenge. I love how the Lord works in the moment. I thought about this earlier. There's always this balance as you prepare a sermon, a lesson, whatever it is, of when it comes time for the application, there's a movement to application. God's Word's not going to be just for informational purposes, right? And so that movement of the Spirit-led application, when it occurs, how much concrete example do you give for action? How much abstract exam- how many abstract examples do you give? And this is a moment where I haven't really been giving too many concrete examples of here's how you or as a church we could do what God's bringing to our attention. It's, it's more or less as individuals, you're having to fill in the blanks as the Holy Spirit leads you, right? That's important, so you own it. But I, I do think there's a, a challenge we could embrace at hand to visibly show an opportunity, a visibly show us leaving the nest. I love that we have padded pews, right? That's comfortable. And by and large, we get into a habit, which is totally fine. We're creatures of habit. We like to sit in the same place. Nothing wrong with that, right? But what if, for a Sunday or two, everybody moved up? <laughs> look at you look around. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what? Is he for real? Is he serious? Yeah, no, no. Hey, I'm not saying that God says they ain't do it or not. Or it's, not that, it's not that. It's an opportunity. Pretty easy one, honestly. But I do know, just as Megan read, that God gives us a little to test our faithfulness before he gives us much. And so maybe a simple way to show God our obedience to what he brings to our attention is to engage in the worship experience next Sunday a little closer so we can hear your voices a little louder and they'll be a little more unified and you'll be a little closer to the message as well. What if those last five rows were totally empty? I wonder what that would look like. Y'all are counting the rows. I'm on one of those five rows right now. An opportunity, a simple, easy example to hear God's word and obey it and to embrace the small responsibilities so that God will give us larger responsibilities. Pray about it. And let's see what happens. Let's hear God's work this week and obey it, and you'll be amazed at the results. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we come before you thankful for these moments you have given us to worship and listen and be filled by your Spirit and be encouraged and convicted. So God, as we sing now, may we sing with our hearts out, our mind focused on how you will guide us this week. And when we gather back together next week, show us an even higher level of intentionality. As you bring it to our attention, we will obey. We love you, God. Amen.